If you would, open with me to the Old Testament in the first psalm, Psalm 1. We'll use this as a scripture helping introduce our study this morning. Beginning in Psalm 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore un the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. I read the whole thing, but basically I want to go back to the first verse. And notice the digression of a person as he heads off into error. Notice that there is a blessing pronounced upon the man that does not do this. But notice the way into a practiced life of sin or sins. He's the person that walks in the counsel of the ungodly. Notice he begins by simply walking. But now he stopped in the next one. He stands in the way of sinners. That always indicates giving more attention to what he heard as he was walking by. But now he's taken up residence there because he sits in the seat of the scornful. He's adopted whatever it was that was wrong into his life. We can learn much about how we get ourselves into a mess by simply looking at this. Now notice the Lord pronounced a blessing on a person who doesn't do this. That means we can identify in our own lives when we're doing this. And we can know each step if we're honest with ourselves and the right application of the right divided word to our lives when we're headed in the right direction or wrong direction. Now, one of the greatest tragedies of the age in which we live, and it's always been of this world, but sometimes it's far worse in certain generations than others. I say a tragedy is the unwillingness of men to search the scriptures for themselves. Now, there are more things than that around that are tragedies. Today, we live in an age that also says, yes, I know that it's the Bible, the Word of God, and I know what it says, but, and any time you find that happening, you know they don't appreciate like they need to to be saved by it, the authority of the Word of God. Because for the person who understands that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 6 and 17, and who also knows that we're to study to show ourselves approved unto God, workmen that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, then to approach the Bible and say, I know that's what it says, and even be able to explain to somebody what it means and the application of it and wherever it applies, but yet never to do it, uh, something's wrong. They've got a spiritual heart problem. The arteries are stopping up awful fast. Or they've got complete heart failure. There is an attitude that sincerity is all that matters. And that even if one should believe something contrary to the Bible, something that is wrong, well, it's still all right. We live in an age that says, well, yes, there are standards of authority. There are rules and regulations. There are principles by which we are to live. But we look at those and immediately, so many people today do, try to figure out a loophole to get around it. Or that really did he mean it? 
Our God is so loving and He's so caring and so full of grace, He really won't do what this verse says, and I do understand what it says. So that disposition of heart does not help one approach the Bible at all to study it and benefit from it as God intended. I hope then that if there's anyone in my hearing that has the attitude I've just described, that they will give very careful and honest attention to the things that we have to say. Our goal in this particular sermon then is to strongly, by the mercies of Christ, urge people to search the scriptures for themselves, to investigate, to see if what you believe is backed up by, if you please, a thus saith the Lord. Notice what is said in Acts chapter 17 and verse 11, as Luke records it by inspiration, of those in Berea. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Now, mind you, they were checking up on none other than someone like the Apostle Paul to see if he were telling them what the Bible taught. Their Bible at that time, of course, was the Old Testament. So much of the preaching done then to prove Christ was the Son of God was done from the Old Testament. In fact, Luke is writing part of the New Testament as he writes these words in the book of Acts. That also teaches us that today uh, the Old Testament is very valuable. Paul said it was a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, Galatians 3.24. And you can see why then that in that day and time particularly, but it should be even so today, that we would begin with the prophecies and other matters of like nature in the Old Testament that we might understand the New Testament better. So we might very well say that the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. So we need to study the Bible. We need to know it is a book to be rightly divided. Thus, we need to know how to rightly divide it. And we want to do all of this so that we will not be found believing a lie. A lie is a falsehood. And in the case of spiritual lies, then it means something contrary to what the Bible teaches. Contrary and against it and different from it. And yet the world basically follows after lies. That's how Satan gets any of us to go contrary or against the teaching of the Bible is to get us to believe that whatever this doctrine is, however he goes about doing it, is okay. And one of the ways is, well, yes, it's different from the Bible, but it's really not that bad a situation. I just heard this past week of an attorney who was trying to talk to somebody <laughs> And he was trying to say to this member of the church, well, you're going to have to give in on that point regarding the Bible. That you have to realize that everything's got to be sub subject to the law or the land. But he didn't get that coming back at him in agreement. But that's the way people think. That's where they are today, and if not in worse situation. Now, notice what we have in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 along this matter of believing a lie. And do some honest soul searching with me in the light of God's good truth. In the second epistle of Thess to the Thessalonians, Paul is dealing with some false concepts that they developed through their misunderstanding of some of what was written in the first letter to them. They had got the idea that Jesus was coming very quickly. And they'd virtually quit doing what was necessary for people to live on this earth because why do it if he's coming tomorrow or next week or a few weeks from now? So if you go into the second letter, you'll see him explaining some things and showing that he didn't ever, ever say that. He never said that in the first letter. And in doing that, he shows what must take place before the church will have a great apostasy in it. Something's got to happen first. And when we get to this, we look in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and begin in verse number 9. And we'll read through verse number 12. Paul writes to the church in Thessalonica, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. Notice the lie there. By the way, it doesn't say that they were true wonders. 
We know what a miracle is as the Bible sets it out. But they were lying wonders, so they weren't genuine. Now watch what happens in verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Well, how is it they could be in that sad condition? How is it they could be in an unrighteous state, believing a lie? That's how you know you are deceived, is to believe a lie rather than the truth. And he says, because, here's the reason, they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Now watch what you have developing here. And for this cause, well, what cause, Paul? That they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now let's look at this for a moment because some people say, well, you mean God actually will deliberately and directly and personally delude somebody, send something to them that's not real and not factual and not actual? So that they would believe a falsehood. He would do that to them. That they might be damned. I thought everything God did toward man was to save his soul. Because he loved man. Doesn't John 3.16 say that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Indeed it does and the Bible does not contradict itself. Well let's think about this for a moment. What do we learn about these people in verse number 10? Well, it tells us they're deceived and they're deceived by unrighteousness. Well, David said in Psalms 119, verse 172, all thy commandments are righteousness. Now, if it's unrighteous, what do you think that has to do with the commandments of God? It can't be according to the commandments of God. If it's unrighteous, it must be contrary to the commandments of God. It must be error. It must be false doctrine. Well, and with all the deceivableness of unrighteousness, in who? In them that perish. Well, perish spiritually. Cut off from God. If they die that way, they're headed for a devil's hell. Well, here's what happened to them. They received not the love of the truth. Brethren, that ought to be frightening to a great many people because if I don't love the truth, who is it that's responsible for me not loving the truth when all is said and done? Old people may have set a bad example before me. They may have taught me false doctrine. They may have opposed me in my trying to do good. But ultimately and finally, who's responsible for loving the truth? I am. And notice these folks receive not the love of the truth. What happens to a person when they just don't love the truth? When truth doesn't mean something to somebody except as it serves their purpose, what are they apt to do when it doesn't serve their purpose? What are they apt to do when it puts them between a rock and a hard place? Well, they're going to give up the truth. That's exactly what they'll do because they don't love it. But you can't be saved unless you love it because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Before you ever get down to believing in God on the basis of the Bible, so then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17, what must you have? What must you possess? A love of the truth. Now, we're made in such a way is that we ought to be happy only with truth wherever it is. That's the reason we try to spend a lot of time teaching people about truth and what it is and not long ago we preached on truth in a couple of different places one of them was here pointing out the very nature of truth truth is just what a thing is truth corresponds with reality to state something and call it the truth when it doesn't correspond with reality is lie so truth corresponds to reality. Well, before I ever get to the Bible as the Word of God or the Gospel as the power of God to save us, Romans 1, 16, what is my attitude about truth on anything? It better be that it corresponds with the reality on the job, in the home, in all of my dealings with people. That's the nature of truth wherever it is. Whether it's of nature 
or whether it is revealed truth revealed by God through the Holy Spirit and the inspired writers in the Bible specifically addressing the forgiveness of sins and the salvation of man. So I must learn to love truth and I must go wherever truth leads me. Now a lot of folks say, well, that's right. That's right. Until they follow it as close as they know how and they see some of the places it leads them and they're just not ready for that. They find out there's something more important than the truth. Now what's happened to them? They don't love the truth supremely. And what does that mean is going to happen in their life when it comes to the truth of God relative to salvation? Well, listen. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Now, the question is, how does God send that strong delusion? Because he wants all men to be saved. Well, first of all, these people have indicated we don't love the truth supremely. We've already indicated that because we're not going to be in obedience to some of it if it doesn't suit us for whatever reason. The delusion is simply this. Let me use this for an illustration. If this aisle going down the middle of this auditorium toward the back door, if that aisle in all of this auditorium represents truth and from here to back there, the road to heaven, then anything off of this aisle is not the truth. It's a falsehood. It doesn't correspond with the reality of the God's Word, and you're lost if you get off of it. All right, now what do these people do? They cease to love the truth. Well, since they cease to love the truth, they became deluded. Why did they become deluded? Why did they not see things for the reality that it is. They didn't want to. The Bible said this. It didn't suit them. They changed. And thus when they departed from that which is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth concerning salvation, or any component part of it, where did they have to go but to a lie? Now that's how the strong delusion is sin. It's like when it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Well, he didn't say, now, Pharaoh, you must do that, this, but I'm not going to let you. Because when God provides the way through his word and proves it to be his word and not the word of man by confirming it with miracles, signs, and wonders, and you reject that, guess what you do to yourself? You begin to harden that heart. And finally, you can reach a stage where... The Word of God won't mean one thing in the world to you. won't prick your conscience. And that begins with the first step you make away from whatever component part of the gospel that you don't like. And when you begin to resist what you know that it says, justifying yourself in your own mind, that God doesn't mind you setting that aside. He'll understand. He's a loving God. He's a gracious God. And you don't even realize by holding that view, you hold a view that justifies you in sin. And those things are never said about somebody as far as God's attitude toward them when they didn't love the truth. So, God sends that delusion in the sense there's only one way from earth to heaven, the gospel route. And if you don't love that, the truth of the gospel, then there's nothing left but lies, folks. And lies delude Lies do not allow you to see things as they are, whether it's in your own life or the lives of others. They simply cause you to believe a lie. But your choice, you see, you have the choice. I have the choice. And it all begins with, and I need to ask this question honestly and before God, do I love the truth of the gospel more than my friends and my family, and my money, and my job, and this nation, and anything else. Because everything uh, must be secondary and subsidiary to the interests of our Lord. That's the point the Lord made in Matthew 6, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, 
because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned. Now watch how these people are, and you'll get a little review of it, who believe not the truth. Well, they're not going to believe what they don't love. But, well, what were they like? They had pleasure in unrighteousness. They enjoyed violating the commandments of God. That's what pleasure is, you know. Pleasure is enjoyment. You like doing it. You feel good doing it. Well, they had pleasure in unrighteousness. Remembering that David said the definition of righteousness is all thy commandments are righteousness. Psalms 119 verse 172. So they had pleasure in violating God's law. They didn't love the truth. They loved violating God's law. And because of that... They wouldn't follow the way of truth and the word of truth and the only route there is to heaven. So therefore, only a lie was lived. And that's what they loved. Because they loved unrighteousness. Notice also an example of this from the Old Testament. Let's remember that Paul said of the value of the Old Testament in Romans 15 verse 4 is this. Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. In 1 Kings chapter 13, verses 1 through 24, and I won't read all of it, we find that God has commissioned a young prophet who lived in Judah to go up to the northern kingdom, the kingdom now is divided, and Jeroboam a wicked man, is king of the northern kingdom of Israel. And he's carried the nation into idolatry, which, of course, was plainly forbidden by the law of Moses. But this man, of course, was like those we just read of in 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 and 2, 12. So the young man goes there, and verse 1, he stands by the altar, whereby they burned incense to these gods and their false worship. He does exactly what God told him to do. He cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name. I wish we had time to develop that as far as the messianic prophecies of our Lord. And upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burned upon thee, because Josiah was a person who restored the law and rooted out apostasy in Israel. Well, notice, and he gave a sign in the same day. In other words, God is always, in giving his revelation to man, gave proof that it was from God, not from man. And now this prophet, and prophet means one who is a spokesman for God, who speaks God's will, has declared the will of heaven, which was already taught in the law of Moses about idols and idol worship. But now this prophet has a miracle that God's enabled him to work so that this fellow will know, that is Jeroboam, that what he says is true and from God. This is the sign which the Lord hath spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. It came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which had cried against the altar in Bethel. Now watch how a person acts. He doesn't love the truth, but loves unrighteousness. He has pleasure in it. Watch how he acts when the truth has been taught to him and proven to be the word of God. That he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. And his hand, which he put forth against him, dried up, so that he could not pull it in again to him. But notice the attitude. It wasn't to submit to the truth of the prophet and correct matters. It was to get hold of the prophet. Well, he can't get to God, but he can get to God's spokesman. The altar also was rent, the ashes poured out from the altar, according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. And the king answered, well, things changed in his mind, at least for the present, and said unto the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God, and pray for me that my hand may be restored me again. And the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored him again, and became as it was before. Now, as, whole, as we would say, tune has changed here toward the prophet now. 
But you know, down deep in his heart, there'd been no real repentance because all you've got to do is read the rest about Jeroboam and realize this was momentary and for his own preservation. But he gets very flattering here and says, And the king said unto man, verse, the man of God, verse 7, Come home with me and refresh thyself, and I will give thee a reward. Now, you watch people who are caught up in sin, but they want the favor of the preacher. They'll get very uh, slapping on the back attitude, big smiles on their face, scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, etc. Maybe if I'm nice to him, maybe you won't say these things about me anymore. And here it starts. And the man of God said unto the king, If thou wilt give me half thine house, I will not go in with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. Well, you know, I can't think of many people that would have been glad if he said, Here, you can have half my house. You remember down in Egypt, as God providentially worked long years before to bring the descendants of Jacob and Jacob himself down to Egypt, where Israel grew into a nation. Joseph, by providence of God, was already there. He did these many wonderful things, and Pharaoh made him second only to him in all the land authority. Well, you'd think that a person would say, Well, I like this. There's a lot of folks who have said, well, now how can I work this out so that I can get what I can out of this guy while he's in a good mood? That seems to be the good American attitude. For so it was charged me, now we learn the rest of the story of what God had told him, by the word of the Lord, saying, eat no bread, nor drink water, nor turn again by the same way that thou camest. So he went another way and returned not by the way that he came to Bethel. Now things begin to change. Now things begin to change. Look at verse 21. The old prophet comes on the scene and tells, asks, invites him. He's heard of the situation because his sons were there when all this transpired with Jeroboam. They've come home, brought the news. So he gets on his donkey and takes off after the young prophet, finds him, uh, and he says, come on home with me. Well, the young man tells him, Exactly what he told Jeroboam, verse 22. But then, here's what comes up. That's really earlier than verse 22. But here's what comes out. The man lies. The man says, well, I'm a prophet of God. And God, an angel, appeared to me and told me to tell you to come home. And the young prophet, verse 18, verse 19, verse 20, Obeys the lie, goes home, and then you're down to verse 22. When they're sitting at the table, God comes upon the old prophet and declares the doom of the young prophet because he disobeyed God and went to the old prophet's house. Now, it may seem, it may seem that the old prophet is the bigger of the sinner. But that's not the point of the story. No one's saying the old prophet didn't sin and would have to suffer for it, as all sinners do. The point of the story is this young prophet was to do only what he was authorized to do. He had had the will of heaven given to him by God, and he had it confirmed by the sign that was done, for he could know that it was God's will he had carried out before Jeroboam, as well as Jeroboam could know that what the man said was what ought to be by the same sign. Now, the old prophet says this, but there is no confirming sign. And the young man believes it, and he ends up being killed on the way home by a lie. Now, we could go into the account and other places in the Bible of what it is to tell a lie. That's what the old prophet did. But this is having to do with believing a lie. There are always going to be liars. They're going to be liars by the example they live because the example of their lives is that they don't do what God said. They may not overtly and directly come out and say, you don't have to obey that commandment. But by their lives, they say you don't. Or you can just come out and say, no, that's not binding. You don't have to be baptized to be saved. You don't have to be baptized to be saved at all. When Peter says, Baptism doth also now save us, 1 Peter 3.21. And all the dictates of men throughout all history, and however long it goes in the future, till the end of time, can't change the infallible, the inerrant, the all-sufficient, final, and objective standard of truth or any component part of it. 
But when we start trying to figure out ways to get around it because we love the pleasures of unrighteousness more than we love the truth for whatever reason, maybe it's the loss of a job, the loss of a friend. In fact, some years ago, quite a few years ago, there was um, eldership that one man in particular was known very much for his stalwart stand against Aaron for the truth. And yet all of a sudden things happened to where this man caved into the whole thing. And people were puzzled. They couldn't figure it out. I don't know that anybody's figured it out to this day. Except they know he doesn't stand for the truth anymore and he's embraced error. Some even thought that, well, maybe somebody had something on him, <laughs> as the old saying goes. Maybe it was a bit of blackmail. The point is, he didn't love the truth supremely. That I know. Anytime anybody runs after false doctrine and condones a lie, they have pleasure and unrighteousness for some reason. They get some happiness out of it when the Bible's very clear as to what you ought to do when you ought to do it and how quickly you ought to do it. Something holds people back from rendering obedience to God. And it's not God, nor faithful children of God. Well, then who can it be? Brother Deaver, long years ago, he'd been dead a long time, well, quite some time now, wrote a little article that said, listening to the voice of Satan. He did not mean in that article that you're actually hearing Satan speak to you in your mind and hearing an audible voice. What he meant was, when you know the will of God and the book of God, you know the obligation is laid upon your shoulders that it is God's will that you do this. And you start having thoughts that cause you to try to figure out a way not to do it, then just write that down and think of it as the voice of Satan and just kick it out of your mind and go ahead and do what you know the Bible said to do in the first place. Brethren, that's the way it's right. And can't be wrong. This young man believed the lie. He wasn't cautious. He wasn't careful. Brother Buddy, he wasn't circumspect. It served his purpose and he fell apart. Do you remember what, thinking of the old prophet, what he had to say? Do you remember how Paul warned the Galatians? Remember the old prophet over here said, an angel told me, I'm a prophet of God too. I've often wondered as I pause to throw this out, if he was a prophet of God, why wasn't he down there, Jeroboam, telling him exactly how to carry the cabbage? But he wasn't. Maybe he was embarrassed because a young prophet did it, and he didn't. Maybe he had tried, and it didn't work, and he just run up the white flag and said, I quit. I don't know what it was. He just wasn't doing what he ought to as a prophet of God concerning Jeroboam and idolatry. But the young prophet had to come out of a Judah and come all the way to Israel and say this to him. The old prophet was willing to lie to him to get what he wanted. And people can do things that amaze me. And it amazes me how they get compelled in their own mind to do it when it's a violation of the Word of God. It's a lie. Notice what Paul said to the Galatians concerning their departure, the process of departing from the truth they were in. And see if it doesn't sound like what happened to the old prophet when he said, well, an angel told me, isn't prophet of God, that you could come home and eat with me. He says in verse 6 of Galatians 1, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Now watch what he says. Though we are an angel from heaven, Preach any other gospel. In the Greek, it means a gospel of a different kind from what I originally delivered to you. Preach any other gospel unto you than that which ye have, we have preached unto you. Let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. But then watch what he says. And this must ever characterize the person who loves the truth of God supremely. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. That means that if there's that disposition of mind behind your dealings with people that says, I've got to make these folks happy. 
you're going to go down the drain somewhere on some point. You're going to believe a lie somewhere because that's the disposition that says, I have pleasure in unrighteousness if it's necessary to please certain folks. Paul says, that's not me. And he says, it better not be you. So we need to be mindful of these fundamental points. Now, notice that the young prophet right there before Jeroboam resisted that direct invitation. Yet over here, we would say the wool was pulled over his eyes. He accepted the statement that this old prophet was what he claimed to be. He didn't research it. He didn't look into it. And he yielded. The rewards of the king didn't entice him. And you know, this young man wasn't a bad person. He wasn't some sort of moral reprobate. So you can't dim dismiss his case by saying, well, he's no good anyway. That's the way a whole lot of people do. Somebody goes wrong and they say, well, you know, he, he's going to mess up anyway. And you don't find that about this fellow. You can't help but call him when you read about what I read to you in detail as he stood before Jeroboam as a dedicated, faithful, courageous man. You mean this can happen to a dedicated Faithful, courageous man. It did. Written in a book for your learning and my learning. And we begin with ourselves individually to see if I am that man or a woman. So this happens to many people living today. Good, moral, religious, dedicated people. But lost because they believed the lie. Because they didn't love the truth supremely. And they're lost. Matthew 15, 14 says, Let them alone. Because about those who teach false doctrine among the Jews, such as Pharisees, chief priests, and others, they be blind leaders of the blind. Well, they're leaders. <laughs> A leader has people following them. They're leaders. Jesus said they were blind. And they were blind leaders. Of the blind. Well, how does a person, I don't want to become that. How does a person do that? Just told you. Just cease to love the truth in every component part of it, or any component part of it. Just cease to love the truth and be a man pleaser. And you're on the road straight to torment forever. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And it's their fault, by the way, they're blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. That's serious business. Amazing how in an economy of words, the Lord can state such a tremendous and important truth. Listen to what is said as we close the lesson in Romans 16, 17 through 18 to the church at Rome and the sentiments are expressed this way all the way through the Bible, especially the New Testament. Now I beseech you, brethren, Mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ. Now see if this doesn't sound like the fellow that loves unrighteousness. But their own belly, and by good words, and fair speeches, they deceive the hearts of the simple or the innocent. I believe those words in the Bible because God loves us. I believe those words in the Bible because he knows us. He knows how we are in too many instances. And he knows what leads us away. 1 Thessalonians still reads in verse 21, 5 and verse 21, Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. It may be that some think God didn't speak to correct the lie. Maybe he should have. No, God doesn't have to say anything but one time. He told him what to do. And he says, you don't eat, drink water, or stay up there. When you do what I told you to do, the way I told you to do it, and for the reason I told you to do it, you go home. How many times does God have to say something before it's binding on us? Seems to me, being that it's God, one time is sufficient. See, the young man already knew his orders. There's no use for God to step in and say, oh, I don't do that. He already knew. When God says it once, that's enough. But people confused by various denominational doctrines and other kinds of doctrines and various philosophies, they may think God should speak again 2,000 years after he ended the divine volume and say, well, now wait, here it is. Well, 
2,000 years from now, 100 years from now, must he speak again? He has spoken. God, who at sundry times and divers manners and times past spoken to us by the prophets, hath in these lays, last days spoken to us by a son, whom he hath made heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. Now, how many times must he tell you that before it's going to do any good? See, the problem's not with God. The problem is in my viewpoint and understanding of those scriptures and the implications of them, as well as the rest of the Bible. God has spoken. Now, watch our duty. Speak, Lord. He's done that. Command. What's the next part? I will obey. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. Keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Yeah, but I think, but I, the whole duty of man is to fear God and keep his commandments. Yeah, but don't you think, well, fear God and keep his commandments is the whole duty of man. Now, if you'll receive the Bible as it is, the Word of God, and you humble yourself under it, you won't try to gainsay it. But I promise you, if you don't love the truth supremely and you have pleasure in righteousness, you will find a way in your own mind to justify your disobedience and believe a lie because you're deluded, and you will be damned. Jesus says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. Are you subject to the invitation of Christ to become a Christian? You must believe that Christ is the Son of God, repent of your sins, confess your faith in him, and be buried with your Lord in baptism to attain the remission of sin. As a child of God, if you so sin and sin publicly, you need to repent of that sin, come confessing it. We'll pray with you and for you, and God's promise to forgive. Beloved, this may be the last time that an invitation song is sung in your hearing. Opportunities don't always last forever. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. You have now. That's all you have. And now is the time to make your life right with God. Will you come to Jesus while we stand and sing?